Appreciate that introduction. Appreciate Fish Hatchery for having and maintaining this fellowship gathering that we had for just about every single year for the last <coughs> well, over a decade. And I appreciate the opportunity that I've been given to speak to you this morning. If you would be turning to the book of 2 Kings, our text will come from chapter 17. 2 Kings chapter 17. Now, we find in this chapter that as a whole, the nation of Israel stood accused before God. We find in this chapter that they were guilty of worshiping the stars, serving Baal, and even sacrificing their children, causing them to pass through the fire, as well as many other heinous acts. As a whole, they followed the example of Jeroboam and his wickedness. They walked after his ways. As a result of this behavior, God punished Israel by using King Shalmaneser and the host of the Assyrians. Israel would eventually be conquered and removed from their land of promise, which this would basically bring us to our text, 2 Kings chapter 17. Verses 24 through 41. A little bit of a lengthy reading, but it will serve our message this morning. Verse 24 says, And the kings of Assyria brought men from Babylon, and from Kufa, and from Asia, and from Hamath, and from Sepharaim, and placed them in the cities of Samaria instead of the children of Israel. And they possessed Samaria, and dwelt in the cities thereof. And so it was at the beginning of their dwelling there, that they feared not the Lord. Therefore the Lord sent lions among them, which slew some of them. Wherefore they spake to the king of Assyria, saying, The nations which thou hast removed, and placed in the cities of Samaria, know not the manner of the God of the land. Therefore he hath sent lions among them. And behold, they slay them, because they know not the manner of the God of the land. Then the king of Assyria commanded, saying, Carry thither one of the priests whom he brought from them, and let them go and dwell there, and let him teach them the manner of the God of the land. Then one of the priests whom they had carried away from Samaria came and dwelt in Bethel, and taught them how they should fear the Lord. Howbeit every nation made gods of their own, and put them in the houses of the high places which the Samaritans had made, every nation in their cities wherein they dwelt. And the men of Babylon made Succoth Benoth, and the men of Kuth made Nergal, and the men of Hamath made Ashima, and the Abites made Nibaz and Tarkat, and the Sephirites uh, burnt their children in fire to Adramale and Anamale, the gods of Sepharvaim. So they feared the Lord and made unto themselves of the lowest of them priests of the high places, which sacrificed for them in the houses of the high places. They feared the Lord and served their own gods after the manner of the nations whom they carried away from them. Unto this day they do after the former after the former manner. They fear not the Lord, neither do they after their statutes, or after their ordinances, or after the law and commandment which the Lord commanded the children of Jacob, whom he named Israel, with whom the Lord had made a covenant, and charged them, saying, Ye shall not fear other gods, nor bow yourselves to them, nor serve them nor sacrifice to them. But the Lord, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt with great power and a stretched out arm, him shall ye fear, and him shall ye worship, and to him shall ye do sacrifice. And the statutes and the ordinances and the law and the commandment which he wrote for you, ye shall observe to do evermore, and ye shall not fear other gods. And the covenant that I have made with you, ye shall not forget, neither shall ye fear other gods. 
For the Lord your God you shall fear. He shall deliver you out of the land of all your enemies. Howbeit they did not hearken, but they did after their former manner. So these nations feared the Lord and served their graven images, both their children and their children's children, as did their fathers, so do they unto this day. So we, we see from our text that the Assyrians, once they conquered Israel, they kind of blended together all manner of sorts of people. They moved other captives into the land of Israel, as is customary. If you keep confusion amongst the people, you're able to control them a lot better. Now we just read about a religion which was brought into Israel. There were aspects of this Samaritan religion that would help us in our service to God today as Christians. How does our service to God compare to the religion of the Samaritans? So in the next few moments, we're going to consider three aspects of this religion, the religion of the Samaritans, and apply them for us today. First, we need to consider that the Samaritans practice a religion of fear. This is seen from several verses of our text. Verse 32 says that they feared the Lord. Verse 33 says they feared the Lord, let yet serve their own gods. Verse 41 says that these nations feared the Lord, yet served their graven images. Yet we find in verse 34 it says that they do not fear the Lord. Have we found a contradiction? Absolutely not. What we must realize is there are different kinds of fear. One that is approved of God and one that is not. We must realize that the proper fear of the Lord must be possessed by the child of God. Jesus said that we are to fear God. For he is the one who is able to destroy the soul and body in hell. Matthew chapter 10 verse 28. Peter realized that God accepts those who fear him. Acts chapter 10, verses 34 and 35. Paul taught that we must work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. Philippians chapter 2, verse 12. Throughout the book of Proverbs, we find that Solomon taught that fear, godly fear, is the beginning of knowledge. Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7. It also brings strong confidence and a fountain of life. Proverbs chapter 14, verses 26 and 27. Fear of God can prolong our days. Ecclesiastes chapter 8, verses 12 and 13. And as humans, it is our basic duty to fear God and ultimately keep his commandments. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verses 13 and 14. Thus, the right and proper type of fear must possess or must have proper reverence to God. It will motivate us to refrain from every evil way. This type of fear will ultimately cause the child of God and those really heathens to want to serve God and be faithful in service to him, ultimately to obey the gospel. We see that this type of fear does not only consult God in times of distress or trouble. This type of fear does not only rarely thank God when things are going well. We're not limited to either one of these. But you see today and, and you hear from a lot of folks where they only pray to God when things are difficult or things are terrible in their mind or they forget about him in those times. And then when things are good, they thank God. But that's it. It's limited scope. We see, though, that the Samaritans had the wrong kind of fear. They had more of a terror of God. They acknowledged his existence. And they knew of his power, for they heard what had happened in Egypt. That was published throughout the land. They acknowledged his existence, but they did not revere him. They did not respect Jehovah. So we see that God sent lions throughout the land, and they slew some of them. 
verses 25 and 26 of our text. Now when they did finally think of God, it was mainly due to the resulting realization of the various sins that they had committed. Does this not sound like many today? Many today will only think of God when they're sick. But forget about Him when they're well. They might think of God in times of trouble, but not in those times of happiness. You've heard the old saying that there's no atheists in foxholes. They might make all these different uh, promises to God in that foxhole or really in that dire situation. But when they get removed from that situation, they forget all the vows and promises that they made. And they go right back to the, how they were living before. And many are, you know, struggling financially and they, they think of God in those times. But when whenever the times of bounty come, they forget all about the hope. Many turn to God in times of difficulty, yet forget about Him, and then revert back to normal life when times are better. By doing this, by following this type of pattern, many have assumed the religion of the Samaritan. Having the proper fear or reverence for God will draw one closer to Him. 1 John chapter 4, verses 16 through 18. Secondly, the Samaritans practiced a four-only religion. Their hearts were not properly engaged in serving God. They continued to serve their idols, verses 33 and 34 of our text. They did have a pattern for worship, yet they did not worship with substance. This kind of worship is commonly seen today. There might be structure, there's form in the worship, but there's no substance to it. There's no there's no meat behind it. Now we must note that form is necessary. We're not saying it's not. Man is expected to be spiritual in his devotion to God. And this spiritual devotion is exhibited through physical means. God has provided us ways to exhibit our spiritual devotion to God, and that is the worship of sin. The five acts of worship which we're commanded to engage in on the first day of the week. Second Timothy chapter 1, verse 13 says we're supposed to hold fast to sound or the form of sound words. Worship would be included in those sound words. And we're supposed to hold the form, the pattern. And then worship is supposed to be done decently and in order. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 40. Christians are to worship God in spirit and in truth. John chapter 4, verses 23 to 24. In Matthew chapter 15, verses 7 and 9, Jesus gives a label to those who practice a form over substance type religion. He says, ye hypocrites, well did Esaias prophesy of you, saying, This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth, and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrine the commandments of men. Jesus labels this group of people as hypocrites, and he calls their worship vain. This is a form-only type of worship. The Christian can become guilty of these types. Think about the song we just sang. Won't it be wonderful over there? But then we don't live like we need to, and then we won't ever find out. We might even sing, give me the Bible. But the only time we pick up the Bible is in Bible class on Sunday morning, during worship Sunday mornings or Sunday evenings, Sunday afternoons. Then we sing, here I am, send me. Though we're never present for any of the assemblies of worship, we're never present or even willing to help in the different local efforts. Where our minds wander while the sermons are being presented, even this little short talk, where is your mind wandering? Hopefully it's not wandering. Not because I'm talking, but it's the word of God that we speak. We need to pay mind to it. And this is a, a big one for many. <coughs> 
Do we contribute our money as we've been blessed? Or is it more of an afterthought? Well, the plate's still around. I'm going to dig around and find my last dollar. You have not focused in your heart. You're practicing a religion of form with no substance. <clears throat> Where do our minds go when we take the Lord's Supper? There's things that we must think about, and there's things we must not think about during that time. Worship that has both a form and substance will mimic that of King David. In Psalm 138, verse 1, it says, I will praise thee with my whole heart. Psalm 146, verses 1 and 2 says, Praise ye the Lord. Praise the Lord, O my soul. While I live, will I praise the Lord. I will sing praises unto my God while I have any being. And Psalm 147, verse 1, Praise ye the Lord, for it is good to sing praises unto our God. For it is pleasant, and praise is coming. Is our religion a form only, or does it actually have substance? If our worship does not possess both, it is not pleasing to God. If our life possesses form, but no substance, the same is true. It is no better then than the religion of the Samaritan. Third and final, we notice that the Samaritans practice a religion of compromise. We read from our text that the Samaritan showed favor to Jehovah, yet they had other graven images, other little g gods. Yet they preferred these gods over Jehovah. Chapter 17, verse 39 through 41 of our text. Basically, the Samaritans gave lip service to Jehovah. They gave their false gods their true service. This, too, can happen to the Christian today. We can attempt to serve God while also trying to serve the world. But Jesus tells us in Matthew chapter 6, verse 24, that no man can serve two masters. When one attempts to do this, the world will always win out. This is exhibited in how we spend our time, how we spend our money, what uh, lists on the list of uh, where we give our devotion to, our jobs, recreation, even assembling of the saints, our priority list. I didn't think of it. I mean, said it. Where do we put these things on that list of priorities? If God's not number one, we are failing. You can see this in how some folks attempt to justify their conduct. I haven't heard it in a while, but I know a lot of folks, when well, you point this out, well, I'm just a work in progress. Well, in a, a strict sense, we all are because we're all supposed to be growing. But people typically try to hide behind that. Well, I'm really a work in progress, but... What that actually means, I don't really care about God. I don't care about doing the things of God. And unfortunately, that's by and large the mentality of the world, and that creeps into the church. We need to see and realize that God does not, nor can he, tolerate compromise. God expects each of us to faithfully serve him. He expects total commitment from us. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 through 5. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 13 and 15. We are expected to love God above all others, even our family. Luke chapter 14, verse 26 and 33. To compromise is to commit spiritual adultery with God. James chapter 4, verse 4. Hosea chapter 1 verse 2. Instead, we need to be more mindful of following Matthew chapter 6 verse 33. Seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Now certainly we can see the error, or at least I hope we can see the error that the Samaritans committed. They developed this religion. It was not a pure religion. 
They chose to implement this religion of improper fear, form only religion, and a religion that consisted of compromise. Now, if we're not careful, we too can fall victim to this type of religion, to this type of living. May we give up and put away the religion of improper fear, 1 John chapter 3, verses 18 and 19. But instead, have proper reverence and respect for the Holy God. May we give up and put away a form only religion and ultimately a way of life. Romans chapter 2, verses 28 and 29. And replace that with complete faithful service to God. And may we give up and put away a religion of compromise. 1 Kings chapter 18, 21. There's only two ways. The way of God, the way of the world. Which will we choose? Well, after all, I have to give an account how we live our lives in the flesh. And that will determine where we spend eternity. I certainly appreciate, again, this invitation to speak, and I thank you for your attention during these moments.